First of all, I just want to start by welcoming everyone. I really appreciate you taking the time uh, to learn about this topic. I do feel like uh, reservoirs in general and mitigation uh, are extremely important issues for Northeast Texas, and so I appreciate your interest. Uh, I am really excited today about the experts that we have on our panel. Um, you'll see in a minute, uh, they have a depth of knowledge across kind of all areas that affect mitigation. Um, so I guess I'll start by introducing myself. My name's Preston Ingram. I'm a relationship manager with Texas Farm Credit. Uh, Texas Farm Credit is a member-owned cooperative that finances basically every segment of the agricultural value chain. So we finance land purchases, large farm and ranch production, as well as agribusiness. Um, and anything that touches agriculture or land, we care about it. Um, and so in a large part, the reason we're here today is because of my own personal curiosity. Um, this is an issue that impacts hundreds of thousands of acres across East Texas. Um, and so as a result, I wanted to know about it. And I was telling Jay earlier, I kind of stumbled upon this topic by accident, but realized this is a very important topic for what's happening in East Texas. So um, we did, We, if you haven't seen it in our little uh, text box here, we did, this is our second uh, webinar series. So we, I did a webinar just with Jim Bradbury, um, kind of covered a high level overview of the three reservoir projects that are currently are proposed for East Texas. So that would be Bodark, Ralph Hall, and Marvin Nichols. So if you're interested in those, uh, end of this webinar, this webinar is being recorded and we'll send out a link to both this one and our first webinar. So you can watch both if, if you missed the first one. Um, so I think what I'll do is to start out with, I'll give you kind of a general outline of what we're gonna talk about here today. We do have a lot of information to cover. Uh, so we will uh, do our best to be expeditious with getting it out, but there, there really is a lot of good information and we wanna be able to communicate it clearly to you. So the first part of this webinar is gonna cover policy and that policy specifically, policy driving mitigation. Um, and that's something that you'll find out soon has changed uh, even in the recent administration with Trump. And so there's been some changes there that are really important uh, to understand, but just understanding essentially the, the reason mitigation is required, uh, that, that's why Jim is gonna cover that. So Jim Bradbury is an attorney in Fort Worth, Texas. Uh, he focuses on environmental law, landowner rights, and eminent domain. Um, so if you joined us last time, you know he is going to be very practical and direct. He does a phenomenal job of taking really complex issues and making them understandable for people like me. So uh, also, so the second part of our webinar um, is going to focus on the specific mitigation project that's going on right now with the Bodark Reservoir um, up by Bonham. So we have for that part of the presentation, we have R.J. Muraski and Mike Rickman. Um, those guys both work for the North Texas Municipal Water District. Um, and they, so North Texas Municipal Water District is who actually owns the Podark project. Um, so these guys were actively involved in implementing this project. Mike has 51 years in the business and RJ began his career in the Army um, and then has uh, was with the Corps of Engineers for about six years prior to coming to the North Texas Municipal Water District. And uh, they both have a wealth of, of knowledge. Uh, finally, we got... Matt Stamen, uh, Matt's with Res. So uh, North Texas Municipal Water District has hired a contractor basically to manage the mitigation project. And Matt is kind of the lead on this Bodark project. Uh, so you're gonna get a really uh, wide range of expertise here. And I really, I chose these three guys to speak to us because I don't think there's anybody in the world that understands uh, every inch of this Bodark mitigation project as well as these three guys. Um, so I really am excited about all four speakers and I'm really appreciative to them to take their time to, to speak to us. Um, so with that, I think we'll get started. Uh, what you can see over in your the right hand side of your screen, you're able to type in questions. So please feel free to ask questions as we go along. Um, I'm also going to ask questions to the speakers throughout. So we'll try to make it conversational, although I'm going to try to hold myself back a little bit so that we can keep everything moving forward. Uh, but don't hesitate to ask questions all throughout and then I'll jump in there and ask them or save them to the end and we'll try to have some question answer at the end as well. Um, okay, so with that, I think we're ready. Jim, are you ready to take it take it off? Yeah, I am, thank you. Good morning, it's really good to be back. Um, thanks for having me back. And um, 
you know, really excited about this particular topic here um, to set the stage for our panelists, because I will tell you, I mean, this is a, frankly, a really cool area of the law. Um, but even within that area of the law, this is a super cool project. So I, I am uh, just really stunned at, at how it's been put together. Um, and it's something that probably, um, you know, we talk about these reservoirs, but, but we don't realize all that goes into these entire projects. And this mitigation project is one that is just really, um, you know, some, something that makes you proud. So happy to join you and uh, the rest of these great panelists. Let me, um, you know, my purpose this morning is really to give you the law and policy uh, background that underpins this particular mitigation project. And today we're going to talk about uh, mitigation for, for the Bodark Reservoir, but I, I would like everybody to understand that this, uh, this mitigation um, concept that we're explaining today is something that goes along with, with many types of major projects. It could be a, a, a transmission line, it could be a new power plant in Texas, it could even be a highway built by TxDOT. Anytime uh, a major infrastructure project is gonna impact existing wetlands, uh, streams, uh, jurisdictional waters, um, then there is going to be some element of, of, of mitigation uh, involvement. Uh, primarily by the Army Corps of Engineers, but EPA is also a partner agency in that. So, so understand we're talking about reservoirs in this project today, but you know, as you drive down the highway and see a major project taking place, you're gonna, now you're gonna understand sort of what's, what's going on behind that for this mitigation. Setting the stage for our discussion on mitigation, we really need to talk about um, the Federal Clean Water Act. Uh, that's the big driver. Uh, Clean Water Act is a federal statute put in place in the early 70s uh, that really governs uh, uh, most of our waters, um, our major waters, and we tend to think of it as preventing pollution, you know, introduction of pollutants into our, our waters, but it's got another interesting aspect to it, um, which is called dredge and fill, and that's what we're talking about today. The Clean Water Act uh, prohibits, without a permit, uh, one from going into a jurisdictional water. That could be a wetland. It could be a, a, a stream. Um, you know, digging, pulling gravel out, introducing fill into a jurisdictional water. Um, you've got to have a permit in order to do that. And so that's the background for for mitigation. Um, but particularly poignant that we're talking about this today because I want to uh, brief all of you on some recent changes to the Clean Water Act. If you've been paying attention, um, you know, during the Obama administration, they brought forward a new rule uh, defining the scope of the Clean Water Act. And in other words, if you're looking at a map of Texas or your county, uh, what waters would be federally jurisdictional and what waters would be not? Would not? Uh, tough question, and, and that's been battled for, for, for years, but the Obama administration came out with a rule called the WOTUS rule. You'll see it up there in the slides. It stands for Waters of the U.S. Hey, it Jim. was very expensive. Yes. Sorry to bother you. Could, could you uh, share your screen? We, we can't see your slides. Uh-oh. All right. Sorry about that. You good now? Yes. Yep. All right. There we go. Sorry about yep. that. You forgot to mention that I'm an Aggie at the beginning, so that's probably <laughs> why I missed that button. But um, thanks for reminding me. Okay. So uh, carrying on with this, because this slides will be better than just looking at me. Um, the Obama administration came out with a very expansive rule. It was uh, fought by the oil and gas industry, the agriculture industry. Uh, lots because it included lots of waters uh, as to be federally jurisdictional. One of the first things President Trump did when he took office um, was to uh, issue an executive order saying he's going to pull back that WOTUS rule, scale it back. And so now we're in the last year of the Trump administration and really it's taken that long, but a new rule became effective in June of this year. Uh, which their name for it is the Navigable Waters Protection Rule. 
and, and simply, um, rather than a confusing set of definitions, which the Obama administration had, the Trump administration's rule just goes with four categories of jurisdictional waters. Uh, it, it says these categories are in, and then it defines other categories that are specifically excluded. While not perfect, it's it's much more understandable for, for landowners, for regulators, uh, and for folks like uh, we have on the panel this morning that are putting projects together. Um, so, so brand new, uh, it's just a few months old. Here are the four categories. Uh, broadly, the top one are, are, are our big waters. Those are big rivers, um, the, you know, like the Sabine. It's, it's always been included and always will be included. Uh, tributaries is an area where there's been some change. Um, the Trump administration has excluded uh, small streams that only flow in response to, to rainfall. Um, so that's a big change. Then we have rules on lakes, ponds, and impoundments. And then finally, uh, wetlands, which we're talking about today. And if, you know, when I say wetlands, if you're really thinking about, oh, that's the swamp down around Beaumont, uh, southern Louisiana, that's true. But we have wetlands all over the state. Um, if you have a pasture that's got a little corner that's sort of per per perennially wet, damp um, and you wouldn't take a tractor over there to save your life, that's probably a wetland. Uh, you would see vegetation that's very different than uh, uh, what, what you see in other areas. Now these wetlands, uh, defining whether you have a wetland or not is very critical to this mitigation because if, if you are going to destroy or impact wetlands, uh, you're gonna have to mitigate for that and you will have to get a permit from the core. And what you see up here on the screen now really talks about those wetlands that are adjacent, which are very near to jurisdictional waters, and a butt, uh, which means they're right up against one another. You have a wetland that's literally right off the bank of a jurisdictional water. And I keep saying this phrase jurisdictional, and what I mean there is that means it's within the scope of the Clean Water Act. We've got some waters that are simply, they're, they're not within the scope, so impacting those waters is not going to require a permit, but if you do impact any jurisdictional waters or wetlands, then obviously you're going to have to get a permit from the Corps of Engineers. Lastly, you know, one um, talking about wetlands, a new term that the, uh, the, I'll call it the Trump rule, the Navigable Waters Protection Rule is introduced is called the typical year. And if you have an area on a piece of property and it's questionable as to whether that is a, a, a jurisdictional wetland or not, this new rule says that the Corps of Engineers uh, can go back and look at up to 30 years worth of data, precipitation, flooding data to determine whether or not that wetland receives uh, surface water flow in a quote, typical year. Uh, fairly complicated, and, and the Corps and EPA are still rolling out some, some interpretations of this rule. But, you know, for purposes of this part of the discussion, think of the Clean Water Act as looking at a Google map of your property or your county and trying to decide, hey, which, which waters are going to be federally jurisdictional or not. Still not easy, but with this new rule, uh, it's, it's much more straightforward than it was uh, during the Obama administration. Oh, Lastly, hey, Jim, here, yes, sir. Uh, okay, if I'm a landowner in Northeast Texas, help me understand how this change could affect me. So it feels like the, the streams and the normal year, those are kind of the two primary changes for how to define how the federal government uh, can impact my land, but help, draw it out. Can you give me an example of kind of where that plays out to a landowner in Northeast Texas? Yeah, sure. Let's take, you know, let's say you got 600 acres out there and you're running uh, cows on that, uh, on grass, um, where it could impact you, you know, um, you know, all water, you know, when it begins to rain and it, it, that water begins to flow and starts to channelize, you can imagine that flow of rainfall getting bigger and bigger and bigger as that channel gets bigger. What we're talking about is at what point is that, that flow of water become federally jurisdictional? And under the Obama WOTUS rule, it would have been way back up very high in the pasture. That rule said that anytime you have a defined channel that that water is flowing through, even if it's just in response to rainfall, 
that would be jurisdictional. And so uh, the federal government would have, would, under that rule, would have had power to regulate how you, um, you, 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 you uh, use your land area. For instance, if you wanted to build a barn on that 600 acres you have, uh, you would have had to have been very careful that you did not impact and excavate or fill on top of a jurisdictional water. Um, this new rule um, has really rejected the notion of these what we call ephemeral streams, those little, little bitty areas that are only going to flow during rain. And so th that's an example of a big impact and a big help to Texas landowners because you, you can't fill or excavate any dirt in what is a jurisdictional area. Same is true for wetlands. If you've got a little wetland area, but let's say it's miles and miles from the nearest jurisdictional stream, under this new rule, it, it is very unlikely that that would be federally jurisdictional. But under the old rule, the Obama rule, um, it, it, it would have been quite likely to be included. So. This is a huge change for, for landowners, kind of independent of our discussion here on, on mitigation today. That's perfect. Thank you. Okay, so that's, that's the lawyerly background on what drives this. It's under the Clean Water Act. And now that you know that if you impact wetlands or jurisdictional areas, you're going to have to mitigate. Um, in order to get permission to impact those jurisdictional areas, you're going to need a, 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 a permit from the Army Corps of Engineers called a Section 404 permit. And it's a very complicated process. It tends to be uh, expensive and take quite a long time. And um, not to steal the thunder of our panelists, but when you're going to do a large reservoir, particularly along a, a, an existing uh, river, you're obviously going to be impacting uh, wetlands, stream, stream banks, uh, stream conditions, and, and other protected areas under that, that, that Federal Clean Water Act. So you're going to go to the Corps and there's going to be an enormous process of defining uh, the, the amount of jurisdictional areas that you're impacting and the degree that you're impacting them. And you're, you're looking for that permit. This whole back and forth process uh, that can take years is going to define exactly what you have to do in order to get the permit. And typically the price of that permit, if you will, is going to be what we're, we're talking about today, which is mitigation. Uh, there's, there's some priorities in this, this mitigation area. One, obviously, is avoidance. If you can carry out the intended project and, and avoid as many jurisdictional areas as possible, that's the first priority. Then if, you're, if, if it's unavoidable uh, that you're going to be impacting those areas, then you want to minimize those. Steer the project in an area, do the project in a manner uh, that, that minimizes the environmental impacts. And then lastly, which is uh, really where we're at for today's discussion, is to offset unavoidable adverse impacts. And so this whole process with the core is going to be to, to measure those, define those, and then set a standard uh, to, to go out and offset that which you have damaged by your project. And that's where you know, a lot of people don't really know that's going on in the background. Two other terms you need to know for today on compensatory mitigation is this, this offset project. Um, uh, restoration of wetlands, that means you may be going into a wetland that is uh, degraded uh, and needs to be reestablished or rehabbed. Um, there are situations where you would be actually establishing a new well. It doesn't exist, and you're you're going to you're going to create it. It's a project. Um, somebody like RES, who's going to talk about that's what they do. You may enhance existing uh, wetlands, or or the, uh, likewise, you may preserve existing wetlands. So let's say you, you know how many acres you're impacting. The Corps has told you, look, you're going to have to do uh, X and such uh, offset in order to, to account for the damage that you've created with your project. Three primary ways that you would, uh, you would do that. Um, one, which is called a mitigation bank, which I think is, is, is one of the coolest uh, w w ways that you do it. But there are private for-profit entities out there who are rehabbing and creating wetlands. Uh, they're, they're taking property that is degraded and bringing it up to uh, very high quality 
uh, environmental project, and then the Corps of Engineers gives them permission to sell credits, um, which is a unit that that a project owner would buy. They'd be told by the Corps, you have to buy so many wetland credits and so many stream credits, and they would go out there and pay. And it's a it's a market transaction. The price is determined by a willing buyer and willing seller. So there you're you're buying those credits and funding a private entity who's doing the offset project another one is the in lieu fee program it's it's probably the least used but in essence uh an applicant for a project would uh in essence pay a fee uh in, in instead of buying credits or doing a project then the third is permittee responsible mitigation which means the Corps says okay we're going to give you your permit but you must go out there and and create a project, fund a project with your own dollars, and 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 build a project that matches or exceeds the damage that you have created from from let's say your reservoir, or your highway that you're building. So those are the three main ways that when you approach the core, you're going to be dealing in, in one of the three of these. Hey, Jim. Really yes, sir. Yeah. So. Help me understand the decision-making process here. So the avoidance, minimization, and offset impact, is that by the project holder? Who makes the decision which category you fall in there, the project holder or the core? Well, um, it, it, it's a little bit of a balance. I mean, those okay. priorities are there in the law, and up, you know, what's up there now is a citation to there's, you know, very elaborate and long set of, of uh, federal regs on this that set those priorities. And so a project owner, when they're moving forward, beginning to design these with their um, their engineers, they know that you're going to when you approach the core, you're going to want to show them that that you have avoided to the extent possible. That's going to be one of the primary questions they're asking you. You don't just go out there and design it the way you want and and impact a bunch of wetlands and jurisdictional waters. So those th th those are a set of priorities such that when you approach the Corps of Engineers, you're going to be able to tell them, look, these impacts that we're showing are really the least impact that we can make uh, and still carry this project out. Now, there's back and forth. They may have a different view. They may say, oh, no, you know, we, we think you can, can tweak this, tweak that, adjust it here, and, and, and impact fewer. Uh, but but the way it really works, the talented experts like we have today are going to know when you design a project, you're going to need to the extent possible to avoid uh, unnecessary impacts. But a reservoir is one that it is just, it, you know, you're, you're building uh, a major project in a in a river. Um, so it is very difficult to to accomplish that avoidance. But it's a set of priorities. Yeah, good. That helps. Thanks. Yeah, just um, basically this, you know, and it's not just like, you know, simple. The course says, okay, go out there and give it your best shot. These are very elaborate and precisely developed plans, um, which, which which you will hear about. And a mitigation plan, which you see up there on the screen now, are, uh, in essence, the elements that you'd see in a plan. They're quite lengthy. Uh, and this is developed between the applicant and the Corps of Engineers before the Corps signs off on it. A couple of things that I'll point out there are monitoring requirements and long-term management plans. This is not just a one-shot, go out there and do a project and, you know, then you drive away and, and, and hope for the best. Uh, when you do one of these, these offset projects, you're going to have to define what your long-term management plan is, and it, it, it's virtually uh, perpetual. Uh, as well as detailed monitoring requirements. You have to make sure the trees that you planted are still growing, the grasses are, 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 are still established, filtering those waters. So um, very complex mitigation plan. You know, last thing I just wanted to touch on, uh, which is th this, this process of, of mitigation, offset, uh, Credit banking is is probably is very well established. It's been around for years, and it's a fascinating market. And if you've heard that term ecosystem services before, this is this is the granddaddy of ecosystem services. Meaning, you're gonna you're gonna conduct a project that's gonna create damage, but that's gonna be offset. This is a screenshot of a you know it's a publicly available website. 
uh, you can drill down to Texas, your county, or any place in the United States, and you can see who has done projects, who has credits available for sale. It's in essence the online marketplace uh, for, for buying and selling credits. Uh, pretty fascinating thing if you're interested in that, and I'd encourage you to just pull it up. It's uh, called Ribbits. There you see the frog, you'll get the point, uh, but, 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 but that's what it's called. So, you know, if, if, if you don't have any other questions, Preston, that's kind of the legal and, and policymaking uh, foundation that you need to know to understand why North Texas and why RES uh, carried out these projects uh, that they're going to explain to you in more detail. Good. Yeah, that was perfect, Jim. Thank you so much. I do that on that last slide. It looks to me like moving forward, we're going to see more and more em environmental offset uh, uh, methods for buying credits. So not even just in the mitigation world, but carbon offsets, et cetera. I mean, I, that whole marketplace, if you will, is growing quite a bit. And I, I think uh, it will be interesting to watch how it evolves over the next oh, 10 yeah. years. Oh, yeah. No, it, it, it is. Uh, that, that market and others, carbon and, 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 and a whole variety of other areas is, is developing. Even uh, water quality is something that's being done on a market-based system. Uh, but as we grow in Texas and we do more roads, more streets, more schools, more power plants, more water, um, every one of those pieces of infrastructure is going to demand more mitigation credits. So there's a there's a there's a big demand out there for those type services as Texas grows. Yeah. So I'll sign off here and let you move on with the next panel. Thanks for having Good. me. Good. All right. Thanks so much, Jim. Uh, RJ, if you want to go ahead and share your screen. Uh, so we're going to start. Uh, we're going to transition now from policy to talking specifically about the the boat arc mitigation project, which is in the process of being implemented, uh, and both both the reservoir itself uh, is being built as well as this mitigation project is in, in midstream in implementation. So I think we're hitting it at a great time to really learn about um, the issues. So, uh, RJ, I'll hand it over to you, and you can take it away. Great, thank you, Preston, and. We're very excited to be here today to talk to you about uh, what an exciting pro project, the Boat Arc Lake, and everything that's associated with it, obviously with the focus on mitigation. But before that, I want to just take a minute to, to explain who the North Texas Municipal Water District is, because uh, we do more than water. I mean, currently we serve about 1.8 million people near the, the northern part of the Metroplex. We Our service area encompasses over 10 different counties, um, and we serve over 80 communities. In addition to water, we also do wastewater. So we serve about 1.3 million uh, citizens in North Texas. We operate 13 wastewater treatment plants. And why that is important is obviously a lot more water than a lot more wastewater is produced. And we have a big interest in taking that wastewater and treating it to the highest standards before it's released back in the streams and the lakes uh, and the rivers. And then we also do solid waste. We operate three transfer stations in a large landfill up near the city of Melissa. Um, of note, this year we saw an increase of about 15% in our water demand. Um, as you know, we have not really had a hot, dry summer in the past few years. So that is just indicative of the tremendous amount of growth that is happening in the North Texas region. Yeah, so, RJ, I'll just chime in on that. I was on a call yesterday that was kind of talking about the economic state of Texas. And uh, when you look at growth projections over the next 20 and 30 years, uh, this is going to be a huge issue moving forward, water will, and, and all infrastructure, roads, et cetera. So. Yeah, we, we anticipate to double the number of population that we uh, are serving right now. So absolutely. So, so look at, I got two slides on the uh, Boat Arc Lake it's, itself. So the, the, the big thing to take away from here is one is the first major reservoir to be built in Texas in over 30 years. Took over a decade plus of planning and permitting. It covers about 26 square miles, about 16,000 acres. Um, one of the unique aspects of this lake, and, and you mentioned it, Preston, was this is not a Corps of Engineer Lake. This is a lake that's gonna be owned and operated by North Texas strictly the purpose for water supply. So there's no flood risk management aspect. There will be a secondary benefit of recreation, but it is strictly for water supply and keeping the quality of that water is very important to the district and to those we serve. 
um, as well. So in order to get a permit, there's two permits required to be able to build a reservoir and use the water. The first is a state water right permit. The state of Texas owns all of the surface water. So the landowners own the groundwater that's beneath their property, but the state controls all the water, surface water in Texas. So we, we had to submit for a permit for that. Uh, and we received that in June of 2015. We thought that was gonna take longer than the core permits. We actually submitted for that earlier, but um, with the Corps of Engineers and the Section 404 permit, we actually submitted that in 2008, the application itself. A lot of work was done prior to that. So as you can see, it took quite a bit of time um, to be able to, to work with the federal agencies and to receive that permit. And right now construction began in 18 and we're on track to deliver treated water to the service area in 2022. The next slide here, you may have seen this graphic last time, but um, uh, Bodark Lake is solely within the entire county of Fannin. The unique aspect of this reservoir in this part of the state is the water flows from the southwest to the northeast, so into the Red River. Uh, the project itself is obviously the lake. We've got a two mile long dam about 90 feet high. There's a large pump station which will pump that raw water from the dam site uh, 35 miles through a 90 inch pipeline and that's represented by that red line on your map to the city of Leonard where we're building a water treatment plant. From there, treated water will be pushed down to our system to be able to serve those uh, citizens of the 10 different counties. Um, Another important thing of the project is obviously there's some disruption to the road network. So we work very closely with the county and we have upgraded over 11 miles of road, a number of small bridges, but there's a large bridge to allow north south traffic and that's uh, along FM 897. It's a 1.3 mile bridge. And as of several weeks ago, that is open for traffic. So that's one of the major uh, first parts of the project that has been accomplished. So. Uh, last thing I want to just mention is when this project is complete, majority of what you see is now going to be available for public access. So we, that, that's very important. The water and some of the areas around the lake will be available for public access. And that's important as we get through. Day, yeah. Can you help us understand the difference in uh, the core owning the reservoir versus y'all owning it as far as access right up next to the water line? How, how does that change? Good point. So majority of the core reservoirs are built, again, to reduce, reduce flood risk. So the, the core does not allow people to uh, build right up against the lake because those lakes are designed when it rains, those lakes are designed to hold water to prevent downstream flooding. And so when it, there's heavy rains, cores, they want to be able to flood and they have different elevations where they don't want any type of structure on it because um, it, it'll it prevent really the true purpose of that reservoir. Now this, we're, we're concerned about water quality. So we're, there are, there's gonna be fluctuations in the level of the lake. So uh, people will not be able to build right on top of the water, but they will have access uh, to the lake. So there'll be kind of a standoff, what we call um, using easements, uh, but property owners around there will be able to have access, but probably won't be able to build right on the shoreline, if that helps out. That does, thanks. Okay, great. So as we move in the, the mitigation process, and uh, Jim, Jim did a phenomenal job of breaking down how that works. Um, uh, it, it starts with NEPA, obviously, um, and as mentioned, we submitted our application for the 404 in 2008. Um, one thing to highlight here is, is an entity, whoever is applying for this permit, you will not know the exact requirements for mitigation until the permit is issued. So when the Corps gives you the permit, it has that final determination. But along the way, you start to get an idea going through all the process. And that EIS, Environment Impact Statement, that is kind of the heart of the 404 permit. Tremendous amount of field studies are done um, going out, uh, doing in-stream flows, and that's all those different types of studies are listed at the bottom of the slide. You know, hydraulic and hydrology and modeling, economic studies, pipeline, just a tremendous amount of effort. And we did a lot of those 
field studies with the regulatory agencies with us. So we were both looking at the same thing at the same time, which helped in this process. If not, there could be um, some potential disputes about uh, some of the studies that are happening. Another thing to, to notice is it's not a simple ratio of land impacted. It's much more complex. When through this process, we actually had to work with two different habitat evaluation and assessment tool. The first one's called HEP, H-E-P, which is a habitat evaluation procedure. And then uh, in the middle of the permitting process, we had to change to a new process called the hydrogeomorphic methodology, or better known as HGM. It was the first time used in East Texas, so we had a, a lot of uh, learning that both of us went through, uh, but we were able to manage to use that methodology and determine the impacts of the particular reservoir. The HGM model, what it really does is it, assess, it assesses the functionality of a wetlands ecosystem and really how that interacts with all the other structural components of the surrounding landscape. So um, that's what really the HGM uh, did. So as we went through this, a um, lot of good interaction, we started to get an idea of the type of mitigation that was going to be required. And as Jim talked about, we're doing this permitting responsible mitigation. So we were actually taking on that responsibility and mitigating for those impacts. So we had an idea, but again, we didn't know um, how much it would be or the different type of land, uh, land categories. Most of the reservoirs that are built in Texas, you're pretty close to about a one to one ratio. So at least we had an idea what we would need, but as I mentioned, we won't, we didn't know the exact amount until we actually got the permit. So here's the summary. This next slide shows the summary of the impact. When we got the permit, this is what the core has required us to mitigate. I, I know you can't read the legend of that map in the bottom, but that's the footprint of the lake and the different colors represent, for example, that lime green, that actually is riparian woodlands. The orange or kind of the tan is represented grassland and the dark blue is upland forest. So all that was identified uh, for what we have to mitigate for the, the impacts. And rightly so, we want to protect the environment. Um, so that was appropriate. One thing I want to kind of explain, and as Mike talks about how we went after land, is sometimes it doesn't make sense, let's say you have to uh, mitigate um, some upland forest doesn't make sense to go off and just get land that has an upland forest. What you want to find is degraded land that you can improve or uplift the habitat um, uh, credits, per se, so you can get the maximum amount of mitigation on the smallest amount of property. And that's what we tried to do. We were very successful as you hear the rest of the presentation. So um, again, this good process, it does take a lot of time. You've got to be shoulder to shoulder with the regulatory agencies. There's a lot of back and forth. There is a lot of public comment during this process as well, as well, which I think is very important. But through it all, we had an idea of what the mitigation was going to be, but not until we got the permit did we get this final list of that habitat that we had to mitigate for. And I'm going to turn it over to Mike now, who's going to talk about how we selected the mitigation property. And then Matt is going to talk to you about once we knew what we needed, they designed, constructed, and are uh, successfully building that mitigation property right now. So, Mike, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, RJ. We appreciate everyone uh, participating today. This is an exciting project for us, and some people have said I've tried to make a career out of, career out of this single project, and there may be some truth to that. Um, just to reiterate something that RJ said, and, and sometimes I think this is something that a lot of uh, people do not understand. The core is not the one that does the plan on developing your mitigation. So what the applicant is required to develop a mitigation plan for the core to review, comment, and uh, ultimately uh, to concur with and approve with, with input from the Environmental Protection Agency. So it's several iterations that you go through to get to a plan, and it took us several years to do that. And the way we started out looking for a mitigation site was looking for one that was one, I didn't, it was near the project. But more importantly, we needed to know from both the federal agencies and the state agencies what they were looking for. Because as RJ said earlier, this was the first reservoir being constructed, permitted being constructed in Texas in, in almost 30 years. 
And if you think about that, well, most people at state and federal agencies usually retire before 30 years of service. They get 30 years of service. So we were starting out with most of the folks having never permitted a project this size. So we were going through the learning curve also, uh, along with the agencies. So our thought process was, let's start at the very beginning and get everyone in the room and let's find out what studies, what analysis, what tools do we need to make sure that we are compliant with all the state and federal rules. Because the worst thing that could have happened is let's start building this facility and then have a federal lawsuit that says we're not compliant. So we, that was our goal, was to make sure everyone was part of the process and to make sure that when we got through, everyone was satisfied. And part of what RJ was talking about, where we went from the HEP model to the HGM model, was because that was new technology. That was something that didn't exist when we first started. And some of the federal regulatory agencies thought that that would be a better tool to use. The district concurred. Uh, originally, it was thought that we would have to have a lot more mitigation. And you're going to see in a minute that it, it wasn't a lot more mitigation because of the way that you use that functional analysis. So the way we started looking at mitigation was, oh, my gosh, we're going to have to have a minimum of 16 to 20,000 acres on top of the 16,000 acres we're buying for the reservoir. So how do we find that? Well, fortunately for the district, it found us. Uh, we had a potential landowner that was looking at buying River by Ranch that was wanting to convert it into a mitigation bank and wanted to sell the entire bank to the district. Uh, fortunately for us, that land acquisition didn't take place. And so we thought, well, if they can make a mitigation bank out of it, it may be suitable for our mitigation site. So we we went and looked at it. Um, it's the first time in my life I had seen 8,000 head of cattle in one area. But that's what was on the ranch the day we went up there. And it, it's a full working ranch with farmland on it. There's not a lot of trees. Everything had been cleared. They, they cut channels in it to get rid of the water. So it was a dried out area, uh, pretty barren. And there was a lot of room, as RJ said, for uplift on that site. The ranch is about 15,000 acres in size. Uh, and we did, during the preliminary visits, we had our uh, engineering firms, our environmental firms up there looking at it to see if it was suitable. And what we found was it was probably the best site we could find, one, because of the type of soils. It had a lot of, uh, there was a lot of room for improvement. And also it was in the same river basin and just adjacent to where the project, where the reservoir was gonna be built, which is all beneficial at making, at, at getting in the regs, complying with the regs. So the walked the property in 2010. And we proceeded to uh, start looking at it. And RJ, if you could go back, I haven't pointed out where it is yet. And if you look, it's the site that is the, in the purple or pink that is up in the right-hand corner of the screen. And th that site is, if you look at it, it, the north boundary of it is the Red River. So it's got seven and a half miles of Red River frontage. And so it is a very, very large site. When you start driving across it, as Matt will show in a minute, it is huge. So it's a huge facility that's gonna be there. So it's something that, that we're very proud of. We think it does meet the intent and we thought it would, I think we thought it would provide all the mitigation that was needed. And RJ, if you would move to the next slide. So why River by One contiguous site, something that is a very, very big, piece of what the Corps looks for. They don't want you going out and buying 200 sites that they're going to have to visit and maintain, help you maintain and do the analysis on. It was degraded. There was uh, a lot of non-invasive or a lot of invasive species there that weren't native to the lands. It was open farm fields. It was 8,000 head of cattle on it. Uh, again, downstream of the watershed, it was the site had been all, gotten all the water off of the site. It was adjacent to, and, and part of it was a wetlands reserve program, which is a, now it's no longer a federal program, but this project is still part of it. There's 2,800 acres of it that's in a wetlands reserve program, which you can't do any farming or ranching on. And it's adjacent to the National Caddo Grasslands, uh, which is a, a, a parklands run by the U.S. Forest Service. 
And there's about 8,600 acres of hydric soils, which are good for wetlands, which is another benefit because that's a big area, as RJ pointed out earlier, that we were going to have to recreate wetlands. And it's hard to do that if you don't have hydric soils. RJ? So looking at when we were going through the process, we found that uh, going from the HEP model to the HGM model, it probably made good sense to go ahead and purchase some additional land that had totally different soil type. And that land is on the upper end of the reservoir. So it's on, on the, it's really on the south end of the project, but the project flows north. And so we purchased another 1,900 acres that was in the five-year floodplain for forested wetlands. And it's, it, it's another site that is right on the creek itself. And again, adjacent to the impact site. And this site has about 1,700 acres of hydric soils. So again, a very good site. Next slide, RJ. So it's, I, I think it's important uh, to point out that when you're, when you're looking at this, how are you going to achieve that? Because you'll see in a second when Matt starts talking, the number of trees that we're gonna have to plant on this site is five million. Think about that. You don't go to Callaway's and buy five million trees. Uh, so we started looking at this. We actually brought in three of the largest firms in the country before we got the permits back in 2015 or 16, including Res, and said, uh, help us understand how, what's the best way to go through this? And so we got hot ideas from them. We put our process together. We said, okay, we're gonna go out for proposals. Went out for proposals. We got one proposal back. We thought, wow, what happened? So we went ahead and went with that proposal and we, we went with a construction manager risk firm. Well, when we finally got the estimates done, the project was probably 40 to 50 million higher than what we had anticipated. So we went back and we talked to the Seymour and they said, well, this is really not our business. Maybe we need to reach out to some of those firms that you talked to before. So we reached out to Res. Res came in, we started talking to them. And it was interesting why they didn't follow up on the first meeting. It was because they didn't want to invest the time and money in a project that they didn't think would get a permit. It's that difficult to get a permit this size through the 404 process. We had looked nationwide to get some ideas on how to, to mitigate an area this large and we looked for three or four years, there are none of this size. When you start constructing reservoirs, those reservoirs, the last one in Texas was constructed back in the late 80s. So it, in a lot of mitigation was not taking place back then. You didn't have to do nearly as much until 1985. So we started looking, we got a, a contract with Res, best thing that's happened to us on mitigation because they had been, really been a lifesaver for us. What we would need to make sure of is that we are meeting those mitigation requirements that, the, that we signed off on, we approached the Corps with, they signed off on, and we have to go out at least 20 years on that because what they're looking for is to get the mitigation established and where it can live on its own. And then that land in perpetuity cannot have cattle on it, it can't have timber on it, but it can have things like hunting and fishing and things like that on it. So. What the district is doing and has been doing for the last decade is we've been working with Texas Parks and Wildlife, U.S. Forest Service, and other agencies about, okay, if we could donate this, if the district could donate this land to you, would you be willing to accept it? And that's still hanging out there so far off that no one wants to commit to it. But what the plan is, since the lake will already have public access, is that this would be like a wildlife management area once it's matured and we can turn it over to an agency to, to operate. So unless there's questions, I will hand it off to Matt and let him show the things that he's done over the past couple of years with, with converting that ranch, the working ranch and farm, into something that is going to be a great environmental benefit to the area. So Matt? might help if I unmute my mic. Uh, the, uh, Jim directed to mention there are two Aggies on this call. <laughs> so hopefully you can hear me. Oh, good, good, you can hear me. Uh, uh, well, thank you very much. Oh, okay, good, all right. <laughs> yeah. 
like a you're in good company we might want to make a tradition out of this now (laughs) well thank you mike i appreciate that thank y'all very much for having me here today Uh, as mike mentioned my name is matt stallman i am the project man for the bodark lake uh, mitigation project up here north of Bonham, texas Uh, i'm physically here at river by ranch right now the main component of the mitigation plan for bodark lake and we're physically working uh working on the project right now uh, there's equipment moving and people are out doing all kinds of stuff so if you hear noise in the background my apologies but i will just start off with it with sort of a breakdown of the mitigation project itself uh, in a nutshell 13,000 acres of habitat that is either being restored uh, or enhanced uh, associated with this mitigation project as mike mentioned there's, there's two main components that being the river by ranch, and then there's also the upper upper Bodark mitigation, upper Bodark Creek mitigation project, just about 20 miles south of me down near you know, near Bottom, uh, which we're about to begin work on here later this month. All total, with all this habitat restoration that we're doing, uh, we're we're projected to plant somewhere around five million trees, um, and I'll show you how that how that actually gets accomplished because I think that's one of the one of the neatest things about the project is just how we're, how we're doing our reforestation program. But to break down the types of habitats out of that 17,000 acres, about 8,500 acres of that are wetlands. Um, somewhere around 6,000 acres of that are, are forested wetlands, and the remainder is, is, is emergent wetlands, the kind of wetlands you would think of where you have, you know, your puddle ducks and whatnot, uh, the forested wetlands, you, know, you have more more uh, species that were adapted to, you know, to, to uh, wet tree conditions, wood ducks and things like that. And then in addition to the wetland restoration, there's a bunch of upland restoration work that we're doing as well. 3,200 acres of native grassland restoration, which, which is, uh, is just a joy to do that work. Uh, and the species that come back from that, I'll show you, is, is pretty incredible. Uh, and then plus, over 70 miles or approximately 70 miles of streams that are either being completely restored uh, as you'll see in some of my pictures or they're they're out, out there already and we're doing enhancement work on them, uh, helping with the control of invasive species and erosion and things of that nature so uh, let's see rj if you want to go to the next slide this is just a, a quick example of some of the wetlands work um, that we're doing out here this picture two years ago showed a cotton field uh, so when we got here uh, as mike had mentioned you know the ranch was under agricultural production and and it's a very productive uh, place for agricultural production uh, and they were doing a great job at the agricultural production but we we shifted the land use in response to the need to offset the reservoir to habitat restoration and i like to kind of say res is sort of like a or sort of like a a, di- a hybrid between a developer and a and a farmer. Uh, in one sense, we come in and we take property and we we develop it into a different use. So it was in one use, we take it to a different use. Our particular development bent is toward something that's that's like a, a green infrastructure or an environmental restoration project. Typically, in order to offset some sort of impact uh, from another project like this reservoir project. But the other side of the coin is we're like farmers too. Uh, we're just growing a different crop. Uh, we have to plant all these areas. We have to we have to nurture the vegetation out there. We have to make sure that the soils are right, that the water is right, that everything is right in order to hit the target that we're trying to hit with ecological restoration. So this is just one example of, of the habitat out there uh, that we're working on right now. You can go to the Matt, next slide, RJ. Matt, is there yeah, like go a... Ahead to abide by when converting farmland over to look like what that last slide was, which is uh, wetlands. Uh, How do you even approach something like that? I mean, it looks like you moved a lot of dirt because I assume the farm field was relatively flat. Uh, Now it has uh, ponds throughout, vegetation changes. Like what, how do you even know where to start? Well, that's a really good question. It started with the mitigation plan that was that was put together by by Friesen Nichols and 
plumber and associates and, uh, and, and, and other consultants that uh, the North Texas Municipal Water District had that worked on this project and this permit for over a decade. Okay. So that was our, that was our baseline. And when we, we had that mitigation plan that the, the beauty of that mitigation plan, I'm going to, I'm going to brag on North Texas here. The beauty on that mitigation was it was descriptive of what needed to occur and the types of habitats that needed to be restored to offset the impacts and the, and the, uh, the amount of ecological function that was quantified by those functional assessments that RJ mentioned before. It was descriptive in that way, but it wasn't prescriptive on exactly how to get there. It had a conceptual plan. We took that plan and then we took it from, you know, basically a, you know, a, a you know, a initial design to a fully complete final design over the course of about 18 months as we were starting construction on different elements and we ramped up. So we, we took everything that was done from, from North Texas and, and all of their, 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 their amazing team that they had. And they had soils investigations. They had uh, uh, tree growth investigations, uh, revegetation investigations. They've done a lot of really good research into how this would be accomplished. And then we finished the design. What we saw when we got here, our own investigations that we added to it, our own data that we added to it, and then as we started construction, what we were learning as we were constructing, because the land started to tell us what the land wanted to do, and we adapted our, our design to match what the land wanted to do, but still ultimately meet the goals that were prescribed or described in the mitigation plan. So, you know, I mean, in a nutshell, uh, uh, Preston, uh, we did a lot of soils investigations, hydrology investigations. We did a lot of work in order to come up with that design. And it's still, sure. and it's still ongoing today. Yes. This, this picture here shows, uh, shows some, some native grassland that we are working on right now. This is actually a, a prairie, a native prairie. Uh, uh, I think it's uh, over in Lamar County, one of our one of our areas that we actually harvest native prairie seed from, and we use here at River Bio Ranch. There's a couple thousand acres of native prairie out there. The native prairie seed mix that we've been using so far, especially the seed that we got from this local area, has done amazingly well uh, in, in that 3,200 acres, and we're already starting to see areas that were formerly uh, row crops coming back into uh, native prairie production. So it's really fascinating. They're gonna be a really neat part to see mature over the next five years. Next slide, Arjo. I told you to show you the tree planting. Uh, and, and as you can see here, it's extremely technical. A bag of trees, and we have a lot of incredibly capable uh, contractors that plant our trees one time by hand. And people ask me all the time, why, why do y'all do that? Don't they make machines that you plant trees and you can plant all these trees? You got the trees you're gonna plant. How in the world are you doing that by hand? Well, Perez's history started with, with, with very intensive reforestation projects. And we had a really good relationship with an incredibly dedicated group of, of, of personnel, Perez personnel, uh, several of which are, are uh, on uh, 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 federal uh, programs for, um, you know, for labor uh, coming out of uh, different parts of Mexico and other countries. And they come in for a season and they do all our seasonal planting. They are incredible at what they do, incredibly efficient at what they do. Um, the other thing is that, that unlike our equipment, uh, they don't get stuck in the mud. And so even under the wet conditions when we plant these trees in the, in the winter time, in the wettest time of the year typically, uh, they, can, they can just roll right through. We prepare the ground ahead of time by using uh, blades to rip rows for our trees in order to break the soils up so that the tree roots can get down quickly into the soil before the summer heat starts to come around. But we depend on 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 these uh, amazing individuals to plant these trees, and in some days, uh, one person can plant about two thousand trees a day. And when we have a full team on site, we might be planting sixty to seventy trees in a day. 
in some of these locations. So we've gotten very efficient at it. Um, the survival rate on these trees that are hand planted are, are, are much better than trees that we've seen uh, when we tried uh, 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 mechanical methods. So we, if it ain't if it ain't broke, don't you know, don't fix it. We we keep doing it the same way because it continues to work over and over again. So we're about three million trees in. We still got another couple million trees planted in the next couple of years. Stream work. I, I just want to give you a quick example, and and this is probably some of the most technical. Uh, and most detailed construction work that we do on the ranch. Uh, nothing is more erosive than flowing water uh, or contains more force than flowing water. And our job here on the mitigation sites was to restore the natural flow of water that had been here before the water was, was uh, channelized, before these, these streams had been channelized. The, the farming operations, agriculture operations that were here before did an incredibly efficient job, a very good job of getting water off of the site or controlling where water would be when they needed it to be there for their agricultural operations. Our, our uh, shift in land use now necessitates that we bring the water back and make it more of a natural flow across the ranch. And so you can see in the foreground of this picture, you can see one of the old uh, channelized streams that was out here is Hunt Bottom Branch. Hunt Bottom Branch had been channelized, I don't know how long back, but but way before way before the ranch had been purchased by North Texas Municipal Water District. Uh, we put in a, a channel that was more representative of what was probably there before that channel was was uh, uh, was, was straightened out. Um, by doing that we slow water down going across the landscape. We decrease erosion and we actually increase water quality, but but most importantly, we provide water for wildlife habitat and for our vegetation growth uh, before it continues down to the Red River. Let me show you an example of what one of these looks like um, before and after it's been constructed. So if you want to go to the next one, RJ, this is this is a, a rags to a tributary to the Red River that we worked on at River by Ranch starting back in November. For 2018, we finished up construction around February 2019, and you can see, you know, where we're doing our final uh, erosion control work, putting down uh, core matting for erosion control in the ground. Those are actually live stakes; they're they're uh, clipped pieces of willow, bud, sycamore, and uh, box elder trees that we harvest down at the river, and then we bring up here and we stick in the wet ground. And these particular types of trees will re-sprout and grow from a piece of branch that's stuck in the ground. Uh, so a uh, way to reforest these areas. Several months later, RJ, if you want to flip to the next one, this is what Ragsdale Creek looked like in December. So uh, it looks like we were never even there. Uh, it looks like just a natural channel when we're all finished, but it is all highly uh, planned and engineered and constructed in order to make it look that way. Next came back from the grass seed mix. You can see that on the right side of the slide. And then you can see the uh, live stakes have developed into um, uh, very fast growing trees on the right, on the left side of the slide. Now, uh, I take it up a little, a little, I'm gonna take it a notch up and I'm almost, re almost finished with the presentation. Uh, this, is, this is one of the main tributaries uh, on the ranch. Got here in August of 2018. Willow Branch, which drains about a third of a river by ranch and goes directly to the Red River, um, had experienced some very highly erosive events. The soil that's out here is very susceptible to being washed away. It's clay and loam and sand, all, all uh, riverbed deposits that have been put out here by, by the Red River for, for a long, long time. And if you put water on it and you just let the water go through with, with no sort of rebage, um, it, it can, it can, it can cause quite a bit of erosion. That was Willow Branch when we started. When we looked at Willow Branch, what we discovered when we looked back in time, as old of uh, aerial photography as we possibly could find, and old maps that we found, we found that the original uh, uh, route of Willow Branch actually uh, 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 ended up in Bodar Creek about two miles to the east from where it was now going directly into the Red River. So over time, Willow Branch had been channelized for agricultural production in order to get that water off the landscape into the Red River. What we, what we did in our design 
is we uh, we put Willow Branch basically back to where it had had been um, before before the before the uh, 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 the uh, channelization events that occurred, adding back about two miles of meandering stream that had not been there before and slowing down water quite a bit. So this is Willow Branch right now. We're literally under construction of this element of the project right now. And this represents the last large element at River by Ranch. When we're done with Willow Branch, we will be 95% complete with our construction up here. And then we will be moving on to the next phase at Upper Bodark Creek Mitigation Site. But it is incredibly satisfying to see how this, how the landscape is already starting to uh, respond for purposes of restoring habitat to this type of work. That design, by the way, just, just anecdotally, we had uh, two weeks ago, uh, we had uh, a little nice, a nice little flood, a nice little unexpected flood. We were 90% complete with our construction of Willow Branch, and we were just about to finish all of our tie-ins and take out all of our temporary uh, water diversion um, uh, infrastructure that we had put in. Uh, seven inches of rain fell in 24 hours and uh, pretty much overwhelmed our construction site. We were fortunate. Everybody got to hide ground in time. We even got our equipment out in time. Uh, but you can imagine after it was all said and done, it left a mess. After the water went down two days, you know, a couple after a couple of days, and we went out and started doing our damage assessments and whatnot, we were amazed to find how much of our restored stream system uh, was still stable and had been left intact. In fact, over 90% of the work that we had done had no damage to it at all from that unexpected seven inch event. It handled that flow. Uh, much better than we had expected it would. So with some uh, some design tweaking, because we're listening to the land, there are places out there we need to do a little bit of tweaking on that, uh, and some uh, redoubled efforts on restoration. It looks like we're going to finish up Willow Branch here probably uh, uh, within the next couple of weeks. Uh, so just a, just a really nice uh, test local contractors that we've hired out here uh, to uh, Wright Construction who's helping us and several others. Uh, outlaw and Hammock Construction, who are helping us out here at Boda or at Ed Ranch. You want to flip that last slide, RJ? Oh, hey, Matt, real quick. Uh, yes, sir. Go ahead. Might be a good place to bring this out. So, mi mitigation is essentially about the idea of e ecological lift. Like you're taking uh, a site at a certain ecological level and lifting it. Can you help us understand what does that mean? Like, I I think I heard you say. You're, you got seven inches of rain, your stream sides held, but so what? Like, what does that mean to the larger ecology? Oh, sure. That's a great question. So, you know, we've got these two functional assessments, the uh, habitat evaluation procedure, HELP, and the HGM, hydrogeomorphic method, that RJ described before. Those are our report cards for our efforts out here. Uh, those assessments were run on the ranch in its original per, in its original condition uh, before the project came out with a baseline number. And the way those assessments kinds of different ecosystem services, like um, you know the ability to to retain flood water, uh, the ability to uh, clean water or water quality. Uh, wildlife habitat, you know, how much wildlife habitat, how many species of wildlife would that habitat serve, all those sorts of things all gets all gets scored in that functional assessment. And when you start out with a with an area that, you know, that, is, that doesn't have um, a lot of function, well, the score is, is fairly low. Maybe, you know, out of 100, maybe it's maybe it's a 10, maybe it's a 20 or so. Our job is to take it up to where it's you know where, where it needs to be in order to satisfy the uh, criteria of the mitigation plan, which might be 80 or 90. And what we're trying to do is provide enough enough lift from the baseline condition to the final restored of the habitat to uh, in order to provide you know, uh, all of those ecological uh, credits, for lack of a better term. The, the difference between the baseline and the final condition 
is what is being used to offset the impacts from the reservoir. So that, that's it in a nutshell. It's almost like a, it's, you can almost think of it as like a currency exchange, you know, it's sort of ecological currency. Um, you know, they, they quantify the amount of impact, and that's a stack of dollar bills, and they quantified how much baseline function was in their mitigation sites, and that's a little stack of bills. And what they want is the difference. We're supposed to deliver the difference in that stack of bills to get it back to where you know it offsets what was what was originally impacted. And here's where we are so far. So we've got 6,500 acres of wetlands complete as far as construction is concerned. Uh, 3,100 acres of grassland, a little over 2,200 acres of upland forest, and about 30 39 miles of streams that we have restored and or enhanced at this point in the project. So we're about you know, two thirds of the way through, a little more than that. Still, even after construction, we're not done. We've got up to 20 years of monitoring that we have to do on some of these habitats uh, and maintenance in order to make sure that that functional lift is achieved. The 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 advantage I, I think, and I think North Texas would agree, and, and Mike, I think you touched on this. The advantage in the way that this project has come together and the team and the, and the, and the, and the contracting mechanisms and the bonding mechanisms that they put together for this project is that RES is responsible not just for the constructions of the project, we're responsible for delivering the stack of bills, the, the credits. That's our end game. And we're not done until that is proved that you know, it, is, it has been accomplished. So that takes a lot of, of the risk off of North Texas Municipal Water District. They don't be monitoring this and making sure it's going to happen. We have to be. We're, we're on the hook to do that or, or we don't get paid. So, you know, it, it, it's a really, a really well-balanced and well-developed relationship and model for mitigation for large-scale infrastructure projects like this reservoir. Um, Mike mentioned that this reservoir was kind of be constructed in almost 30 years. It's the first time to 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 uh, to forge that sort of process for a project like this, and and so far it's I think uh, I think we'd all agree well, uh, very well. So that's pretty much the end of my my presentation there, Preston. I, uh, I'm happy to answer questions. Yeah, perfect. Thank, thanks so much, Matt. Um, we so if anybody wants to type in a question, uh, you're welcome to do that. Uh, we probably only had a couple minutes here, so I don't want to spend a lot of time on questions just because we have gone a little longer than I had hoped. Um, but just as a, a recap, every time I look at these projects, I think the the scale blows me away as far as the number of acres impacted, but then also the the how bit slow moving this ship is. I mean, y'all are talking about purchasing property back in 2009. I mean, it takes some real uh, like vision and perseverance to work through these projects. Uh, so there, there's a lot, a lot, a lot there. Um, and so I think it's easy I, as a lay person to lose sight of it and to not keep up with it. Um, so I think this has just been really helpful to understand what's going on and what has been going on in the past to help me as I uh, watch moving forward uh, to, to new projects or, or whatever. So well, so uh, if I could just add something there. Um, yeah. On the land purchases, we did start purchasing land early, but because of the way the permitting is, you cannot use eminent domain authority to purchase land. We owned within, in, by 2015, we owned 85% of the land for the reservoir, willing buyer, willing seller. Owned the river by ranch, willing buyer, willing seller. By the time all the land was occur had been uh, purchased, there were a few mitigation. Uh, I'm sorry, a few condemnation cases, but they, most of those were for friendly condemnation where there was clouded titles. So when people look at us coming in and thinking we're going to come in and condemn everything, that's not the case at all. The easiest way is is for us to offer the proper price for the land uh, where we can do a willing buyer, willing seller transaction. Yeah, that is fascinating. I think that's a pretty important point. I, Mike, you had mentioned very few, if any, 
uh, eminent domain was used on the Bodark project, correct? I think there's only one or two actual eminent domain cases where the, the, the property owners were opposed to that, but there were some others that had to go through that process simply to clear up the cloud. Yeah, yeah, interesting. Yeah, very good. Um, okay, I do have, uh, I have a two questions here about future projects. So one is about uh, Marvin Nichols. Is that, are y'all going to sponsor Marvin Nichols? Um, and then is it going to look, do you think the process for it will look similar to Bodark? Um, and then the other one just said there's another large reservoir plan by Mount Pleasant, Franklin City, um, I, I believe he's talking about Marvin Nichols as well. So uh, can you just, is there any, do y'all have any comment to Marvin Nichols? Yes, Marvin Nichols has been in the works uh, with Region C since the late 1990s. And Mar it, it, actually the Region D group, when the regional planning groups were first started, asked all of the major suppliers in the North Texas area to come up with one reservoir to supply the needs of North Texas rather than having three or four. And that's how Marvin Nichols has developed. And it is the same reservoir. It's, it's north of Mount Pleasant. But very large reservoir. Uh, it is something that the, our water district, the North Texas Municipal Water District, City of Irving, the Upper Trinity Regional Committee on it. On it will take uh, probably 25 to 30 years to do the permitting that we went through on Bodark. That's based on the permitting process on Bodark. Uh, so we envision there may be other partners in that in the future when we start to build it. In the past, Tarrant Regional Water District has been involved and the city of Dallas has been involved. But it is something the permitting has not started at this point. Uh, we are starting to do engineering studies to allow us to start putting the permit applications together. But that's where we are today. Good. Okay. Well, thank you. So I think it is, uh, we're well over an hour here, so I do want to kind of wrap up. I just want to thank you each for taking the time to speak with us. It's been really informative for me. I hope it has to our viewers as well. Um, we will, this this was recorded, uh, as I mentioned earlier, and and our last webinar was recorded. So we, if you register, you'll get an email from us that just says, uh, uh, has a link to both this and the prior webinar, so you can view it. Uh, also, I mean, I'm just a layman who does this because I'm curious and I find it interesting and hope that others do as well. So I'm going to, we'll send a survey out at the end of this. I'd, I'd appreciate your feedback both on uh, how you felt like this went, how the communication went, et cetera. Uh, and, and then any future ideas that you might have for webinars, I'd be more than open to hear them. So anyway, without uh, dragging this out any further, I really do appreciate y'all's time. This was really fascinating. I've really enjoyed getting to know each one of you. So thank you very much. Uh, look forward to getting to know you better in the future. Thank you for thank putting you it together. Thank you, yeah. Thank yeah. you brother. All right. Thank you very much.